For whom the A push bell tolls, it tolls for thee and it tolls for me because the clock is now ticking. It's casting that big long shadow. One week, one week out from this very moment, a whole big portion will be free and clear. Two weeks out from that, another portion, third week out, all of you, we are, we are right there. So this might be the one really good week in a review for some of you to bring it all together and close that deal. And you're sitting there thinking still, oh my gosh, sourcing. What do I really want to do? Can, can, can we see what we need to do to actually use a document for evidence? Can we make that happen? Short answer questions. What looks good that earns points in real student works? And, and what doesn't earn points? How do I actually do these things with comparison and deliver the goods on that? And of course, multiple choice. What are these? What do the formats look like? What, what are we going to do these questions? What are the various typologies that we have to see and experience and wrestle with in those 55 multiple choice questions? And last but not least, periods eight and nine, the place that some of you just ended today or might be ending next week or depending on your class who didn't, you know, struggling with coronavirus and some things, might not get there at all. We will try to bring you through all that today. It's going to be a really tight episode, as they've all been. Uh, nothing unusual there in that regard. You might be uh, used to that on our end now. My name is Bill Pulaski from Stillen Valley High School in Stillen Valley, Illinois. I'm so happy to, that you're able to join us tonight for AP Daily Live Review, Episode 8. Episode 8, the final episode, eight days, eight ep episodes, periods 8 and 9 over uh, the last of our period of prep work just prior to the exam itself. Um, what are we going to learn? What are we going to wrestle with today in, in our activities? Well, to schedule for night section, we're going to begin with something we have not done yet. We deliberately, Dr. Webb and I have saved this until the final episode, basic standardized test life skills. For many of you, this is not the, neither the first nor the last norm reference standardized test you're going to take. For many of you, SAT, ACT, ASVAB, uh, GRE, LSAT, MCAT, a whole host of standardized test weight. What are some of the skills that you can taper and peak at the right time, supplies to bring in your general time management? We're going to go through some of that. We will review, yes, based on your constant, uh, you know, really real feedback and requests on that. We'll keep reviewing the idea of time period essentials, contents eight or of eight and nine. We're going to get into that, 1945 to the present, two periods together, just like we did in our opening episode, which is going to force me to have to really think hard about slowing my talk down. But I will try to give you a pace on that as we do a really broad brush sort of overview. More specific content in general is always available from AP Daily uh, or AP Classroom, rather, and a host of other sources for the raw content itself. We're going to try to show you how to apply the content there is there and give you some of the biggest uh, biggest picture broad strokes um, because we could easily do not just 45 minutes, but we could do three hours on each period of piece and still just scratch the surface. Exploring examination content. As we've referenced, short answer questions, comparison-based prompts, this to that, this to that. These are a great location for cross-period um, questions, and we'll see one of those play out tonight deliberately. Dr. Webb and I have chosen this prompt. Multiple choice exam component. It's been a long time since in episode two, I talked about the tutorial. I'll give you a brief warm up on that again, even though we've shown you questions this whole time in multiple choice. And then last of all, skills development. We're gonna bring it home with the way we've always started. If the D in DBQ stands for documents, let's look at sourcing. Let's look at the why of happy, or if you are uh, hail, uh, hail from John Irish country, South Lake, Texas, you spend a lot of time with HIP. But either way, those are just the way to get you to the why. Why do I need this document? What am I going to do with it? Do you work in my essay? That's what we're gonna look at. Feedback now for us would be feedback generated to maybe help us be better for next year. Uh, and not that we couldn't use it. Uh, your feedback, as you've seen, has been very instructive to us if we, as we built on the fly and shifted certain things to address your priority. We would love to see you continue to give us feedback for the big picture down the line, even though clearly you've got some more pressing concerns of your own with your own exam coming up. But any time or moment you could take to give us a, a shout out as to what we need more of, what we need less of, how you think it works, or maybe how should we reconfigure it in the future? I think those, that would be so appreciated by the College Board and by Dr. Webb and myself as well. So a little warm up here. What are we going to do to get ourselves all loosened up here for the exam itself? Not going to talk content, not even going to talk process. We're going to talk examination prep and formats. Oh, you've seen this slide 100 times, so I'm not going to show it to you and belabor it. Those of you next Thursday, by this time, point in time, you are free and clear of this. Your examination components are on the left-hand side. Those of you in digital format, your exam components are on the right. And so you may want to become familiar with those times and percentages there. I'll walk through a few of these in more specific detail as we head into things. And many of you don't want to see the slide anymore anyway. You never have to see it again, at least not from me. As for the life skills, what I really wanted to give you, we thought about whether to do this in episode one or in episode eight, and we thought to keep it fresh, episode eight is the place to really put this into your head to think about it. There's a serious way to prepare for standardized testing, just like you prepare for running a marathon. And so 
just like you prepare for a big game or an athlete. I've been a football coach for 26 years, a head varsity track coach for 10. And in many instances, um, been a part of, you know, five state championships, one runner up. And the night before the night before, in some ways is more important than the night before. Because for some of you who are on this or seeing this, you're really invested. And that night before, as strange as it sounds, some of you are going to have a hard time, uh, hard time getting to sleep. You'll be keyed up. You'll be nervous. We wound up for the exam. Not speaking to everyone, but for some of you, that's the case. So if that's the night before, then the night before the night before, try to make an effort to shut it down. Try to get yourself a decent night's sleep then, knowing that you might be a little fitful and not being able to sleep that night before. As for the night before, visual chronology review, our tried and true, which I've shown you, the four by four term sheets, the various uh, models and ones that I've used that my students use working through things. If you've made up your own questions on your own with those, or even our exemplars, laying out some chronology, kind of work through a little just a review of the ordering of things, a little on the prompts they could be on. Maybe practice a 401 introduction and conclusion and think about the things you're strong at. The test will play to some of your content and uh, skill set strengths. Just remember to really work on those. And for digital testers, make sure you are familiar with your login and connection procedures. We'll be addressing that a bit more later on today. The morning of a nutritious breakfast. Not 14 cups of coffee, not a whole bunch of chocolate milk and uh, sugary cereals. Get some protein little protein with you, a traditional well-balanced breakfast. You do need calories to think just like you need calories for a football game, wrestling match, uh, soccer game, tennis match, track and field, whatever it is. So not too much sugar and caffeine that does weird things to your head. And you also don't want to be coming off that sugar bomb crash somewhere midway through the exam and just start, you know, uh, uh, fading out. Next thing, do not I've got to break my own kids of this. I've got to hold them back just like I'm trying to hold my own quick conversation back. Do not stay up half the night till two, three in the morning trying to just get that extra stuff in. You know what you know, you've done what you've done, and that's been a process that you don't do till then. You're actually only going to you know, make yourself fatigued and muddle your own thinking that next day as your, your brain's going to be like kind of a cotton ball of mush there as some stuff's in and stuff, some stuff is out. Please don't do that. You're better served by actually just shutting it down. And you're not going to, every kid says that, well, I can take that on. I'll, I'll win that challenge. You're not going to master two semesters of history in 10 hours. So it's not going to do that. Focus on some high points. Focus on some elements that are worth, you know, looking at and deliberating on. Focus on chronology. But don't try to give yourself the August through May rundown all in one big night. That's what all your time leading up to this is for. And you still have one good weekend. One good weekend to work with this. Small bites, guys. Small bites little bitty pieces, digestible components, break the exam and the content apart into those pieces. And do remember, as we talked about, it can be done. No four truer words were ever spoken. And so keep that in mind. It can be done. You're going to do it as we've always talked about day in and day out. What to bring? How are you going to be equipped that day? You want to bring for the paper exam, two blue pens, two black pens. Highlighters are forbidden in the exam room uh, for some reasons that aren't worth us getting into now. So, but the test is written in black printer's ink. So let your blue pens serve as your highlighter to stand in for things you want to mark and notate as you use the documents and the paperwork for your own scratch paper. Two or three pencils at least, uh, preferably regular ones versus a mechanical pencil because then you get into lead and all those issues. And a soft eraser just to save yourself some time and trouble of uh, working with your pencils. And also a wristwatch. Preferably a watch with hands, all right? If you can still tell time on one of those. I know with the younger generation, fewer and fewer can every year. It's a big sad. But why? You do not care what time it is in the real world when you're taking the test. All that matters to you is exam time. Now, you might think I'm just soaking up all your time here and saying, let's get to the content. Let's get to the part, Mr. Plasky. But that's not it. This is such a life survival skill because my kids, quite frankly, beat the kids across the country that don't finish the test, not only because my kids are brilliant, because at least they had the chance to answer those questions. You do not want to be the student who gets to question 34 on the multiple choice and the proctor says time's up. So how do you do that? You don't want to be doing a bunch of crazy math in your head of, okay, we started the test. It was, it was 927. It's 55 minutes. So 55 plus 27 is what, but I got to go past 60 and carry over again. And so half of that's going to be, you don't want to do that. Keep it simple. A watch with hands, set your watch to high noon. 55 minutes, 55 questions, you just work, you just rock around that clock. So you should be, if you're going to be on pace, 1227, you're on the 27th question, you're halfway home. Now, say for the sake of argument, you're on question 24 or question, you know, 21 at 1227. It's not the end of the world because you still have 
half of your block time to claw that back. So you are not the student who's on question 36 when the proctor says time's up and then you're trying to fill in, you know, saying Merry Christmas, I'll fill in all the dots on the, on the scan sheet to do what you can. Then roll it back again for your writing portion. 45 minutes for your DBQ, 1215, you're done reading. 45 minutes later, you've written at one o'clock, you're done with DBQ. 105, you're done prepping for your LEQ. 135, you're done, you're free and clear. Keep yourself on a schedule. I cannot stress the importance of this. Tens of thousands of students every year who are good, earnest, willing, hard trying kids like yourselves, they mess up and fall down on this exam, not because they don't know things and they don't have stuff to offer, but they could not manage their time. That is the cardinal sin of this kind of standardized test work. And you'll be doing this again for any test you take in life beyond this, if it's norm referenced. Digital kids, have a comfortable, distraction-free workplace. And I know for many of you, that's a big ask. That's a huge ask in the land of corona and COVID. You've got pets at home, you've got siblings at home, you've got parents at home. Make the best of what you can. Your screen will have a timer in the top middle, right in the middle of your screen. So you won't really need a uh, wristwatch to keep pace. You'll know instantly if your portion's where you're at. But do remember, you must log in 30 minutes early. And login time is universal. It's not 11.30 a.m. your time, unless you're on the East Coast. It's 11.30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So that's 10.30, 9.30, 8.30, respectively, across the continental 48 states. So be advised of knowing when you need to log in and what your procedures are. So now, 10 minutes in, whew, we got to get into some content. Opening content, there's a lot to cover, and we're going to try to merge skill sets with it as we go along. Opening topics. What are we looking at here? Oops, wrong way. My apologies. Cold War and the Red Scare. Your first of your topics here, and the opening topics of period eight are thematic. It's a widespread 45 to 80, so it's really on that connectivity in many ways. The origins and motivations of the Cold War. If I were going to sum this up in a non-fact heavy, content heavy, delivering you a lecture for three and a half hours way, I would begin by stressing that the origins of the Cold War tensions are born out of the contrasting experiences and the differing aims of the West and the East. The United States is the only great power that comes out of the Second World War more prosperous than it entered it. Even our allies, you know, the French suffered four years of German occupation. The British were bombed in the Blitz for, four, for five to six, five years. And as for the Japanese and Germans and Italians, they were ground into powder by the, by the violent conflict itself. Their entire infrastructure is destroyed. The Soviet Union exits the war as a victor, having lost 20 million people, civilians and soldiers, and massive economic uh, destruction within their country. They won the same way you win a marathon. They won by finishing, not by being you know, strong and healthy and hearty and hale at the end. So this informs both sides' perspectives. The United States is interested in creating perhaps the American century, a world of you know, free trade, global agreements, um, a world of, of enterprise and commerce and nations collaborating, working together towards a, uh, a better non-global war future, whereas the Russians have faced three great invasions in the West in 150 years. Napoleon in 1812, Kaiser Wilhelm in 1914, and then Adolf Hitler in 1941. Their main point of view and perception is we just need to be ready for the next thing that comes. And it's a zero-sum game. We have to gain. Our gain means that the West must lose and vice versa. There were goals of a worldwide uh, expansion of communism, but there was no set timetable for that. So over the course of the first uh, three to four years, uh, from about 1945 through 1947, American foreign policy establishment has to come to the conclusion that our idea of the way things ought to be is foundationally different than the, the, the Soviet Union's ideas and desires for what they want. And so this leads to the Truman Doctrine and policies of containment as the Russians began to erect an iron curtain, carving off the Eastern, uh, Eastern Europe as sort of a sphere of influence of itself for the Soviet bloc. So Americans then come to the conclusion that maybe staying out of foreign affairs, as Dr. Webb talked about yesterday, might not be the answer to a safe and stable world. The dead hand of George Washington's farewell address is actually finally taken off of American foreign policy. And the country you know today, with a global sort of reach and footprint that can reach out and touch someone militarily or economically, and has these vested global interests, that sort of national foreign policy structure and apparatus is created in the aftermath of World War II as a desire not to have a World War III against a Soviet aggressor nation that is seen by the United States as being actively interested in undoing our way of life. The Berlin Airlift, of course, is the Soviets is an example of a way to wage the Cold War. The Cold War being this fight where you don't want to give in to the Russians and appease. Remember, Berlin was in the 
Russian sector of Germany, and they cut off the land lines and the land supply lines, hoping the Allies would just give up and walk away. Instead, the Allies flew supplies into Berlin for over a year and a half through authorized corridors. That then puts the ball in the Russians' court. Do you want to shoot down jets or shoot down planes and provoke an, provoke an act of war, or do you not? This is Cold War thinking. You don't want to give in, but you also uh, don't want to engage in a hot war either. So you try to find creative solutions. North Atlantic, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, and those that asked, abbreviations like this are perfectly allowed. Just explain them first. And the Marshall Plan, unlike after World War I with reparations that we wanted all the money back, um, the U.S. actively, with the European Recovery Program, engages in trying to rebuild the European economies, thinking that conditions of communism thrived in damaged economies. And so we even give money to our former enemies, the Germans and later on the Japanese, to sort of rebuild their economies on the notion that stable economies will produce free societies and vibrant societies. As for the Korean War, it's a new concept. It's a war between the great powers by proxy, which is a very common thing in the Cold War that stays a limited war. Uh, Truman is advised by Douglas MacArthur, his uh, commander in the Far East, to prepare to use nuclear weapons to stop the Chinese, MacArthur claiming there's no substitute for victory. Truman does not want to engage World War III in that model with this kind of aggression and instead tries to fight a war essentially to preserve the status quo. MacArthur, believing this to be the wrong uh, course of action, goes public with his concerns. And this actually brings to the fore a vital part of American constitutional law, which is the generals in the military, they don't create policy, they follow it. Truman fires MacArthur for this. In so doing, MacArthur becomes a martyr and a hero to uh, the anti-communist right, but it does reaffirm the idea of civilian control of the military. The Eisenhower administration evolves away, not wanting to fight limited wars, into a policy of brinkmanship and massive retaliation, building up a nuclear stockpile to, tell, to try to inform the Russians with our big stick that if they do something we don't like, they need to be prepared for nuclear war. This is good, except the hard, game, the hard thing about playing a game of chicken is knowing when to flinch. And the Cuban Missile Crisis, two clicks down the page, is an instance where brinkmanship almost really did lead to that close to global thermonuclear war, at which point both sides sort of discover to their surprise that maybe being right at the brink of instant annihilation is not the best plan. As for American domestic policy, the similarities of McCarthyism to the first Red Scare, this Red Scare is sort of foreign policy division driven, where the first Red Scare of the 20s was more economically and internally driven with fears of uh, changing the American, uh, the American economy in many ways. This one has a foreign policy angle as McCarthy uses his power as a senator from Wisconsin to go after Americans uh, for their political beliefs and try to destroy their reputations and destroy their chances to uh, to work in the country as a retribution for their being communists. Eventually, he exceeds his mandate, goes after the, the army, and goes after government at a time when the Republicans control government, so he's no longer of use to his party, is ultimately censured for his actions. By the 1970s, as I said, this is a big, long theme, you have the Nixon administration recognizing communist China as a way to play a game of triangular diplomacy to sort of play the Chinese and Russians off against each other to create gains for the Americans. This leads to what is known as detente, or a thawing of the Cold War, and the signing by the Richard, the Richard Nixon administration of some of the first strategic arms control uh, disarmament treaties on nuclear weapons, the SALT, SALT Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, SALT 1 and SALT 2 in the 1970s, come out of this process of sort of thawing the Cold War. As for post-war America, there's lots of economic prosperity in the United States uh, that we see after the post-war. You have 15 years of an artificial uh, suppression of birth rates and marriage rates due to 10 years of depression and five years of five years of war that is now um, a lot of uh, people buying back those lost opportunities in the baby boom and the war put money in their pockets. Remember World War II, economic production for the war successfully redistributed American income, which the New Deal did not do. The New Deal does not cure the Great Depression. World War II does. It's the ultimate jobs program. And so people had that money and they had the opportunity and began making up for lost time in families and careers and workplace and homeowning growth and all that. Suburban growth comes out of this entire process and brings with it, among other things, the process of redlining, through which there was a preferential lending and discriminatory lending for neighborhoods for persons of color or lower uh, less affluent neighborhoods, which allowed the white middle class in many ways to advance and preserve their wealth in the form of real estate in a way that was sort of denied to uh, lower income or persons of color Americans in that process. The National Highway Defense Act also makes the suburbs possible by building the interstate highway system 
it hollows out America's urban cores as suburbs become places for residents, the so-called bedroom community, and cities become places for work. And this is going to engender white flight, as we'll see a bit later on. The GI Bill, which of course provides for Americans, uh, servicemen and women to have low interest loans for housing or college education or starting businesses after World War II, becomes a real adventure in prosperity for the American public and allows them to engage and further uh, advance their middle class American dreams. Consumerism in the mass media, very much like the 1920s. We see if in the 1920s, radio and the motion picture were the driving elements. In the 1950s, it will be the television, which sort of brings people together. And of course, rock and roll music and pop culture with that. You do see this trend of movement towards the Sun Belt, the Southwest in particular, but the American South in general, as our populations move away from the Great Lakes Industrial Basin and uh, New England, the factory workshops areas of there. And like the 1920s with the lost generation, the Harlem Renaissance, you have pushback by cultural and literary critics that argue that America is this sort of conforming society that in many ways is um, too sort of stifling in that conforming. And the beat generation in many ways will give birth later on to the hippie movement and the counterculture that we'll see at the 1960s. As for the civil rights movement, also thematic, and it's a big theme. Our origins here for this second phase of civil rights, as opposed to struggles of the post-Reconstruction era or the Progressive era, has its origins in the Second World War, the so-called Double V campaign of the Congress of Racial Equality or CORE and the NAACP, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, victory against fascism abroad and racism at home, fighting against totalitarianism, totalitarian, totalitarianism in many ways exposed the hypocrisies of the Jim Crow American system as well. And there are some victories that began deleveraging this sort of uh, apartheid color line system that the United States had lived under since the end of Reconstruction. Truman desegregates the armed forces in 48. The Brown v. Board decision undoes the Plessy, the Plessy decision, Plessy versus Ferguson, which had said that separate but equal was allowable. This is undone. And of course, you get pushback in the South. So you should remember some of these things with uh, Governor Orwell Favis refusing to carry out this mandate, which leads President Dwight Eisenhower to send federal troops into the South to integrate Little Rock Central High School, federal troops being in the South for the first time since Reconstruction. Uh, the Jim Crow system exemplified in the murder of Emma Till for uh, speaking, uh, speaking to a white woman without her consent or approval or that of her husband, really exposes the brutal, the brutality, the bloodiness and vindictive violence of this system and changes people's minds, particularly in the African-American community, to, to activate against this. The Montgomery bus boycott, which uh, from uh, Rosa Parks fame, in which you see nonviolent economic protests being established as part of the civil rights toolkit to uh, engage in change on public, uh, public transportation, public transit to also abolish the color line. Also morphing then into sit-ins and lunch counters uh, for service, uh, desegregated service in North Carolina and beyond. So to continue this movement, that's a huge amount to put on one slide. I get that. And that movement continues on the second slide as we touch these major themes here. Uh, the early movement culminates in the March on Washington in 1963, which was actually a march against poverty, which uh, Martin Luther King delivers I Have a Dream speech, a dream that's still being sought. And then voter registration, the Freedom Summer, as college students converge on the American South to register African Americans to vote in, in situations and systems in which they'd historically been denied that opportunity, which incurs pushback and violence from the white South. The twin pillars of success of this first phase of the civil rights movement are the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 64, which outlaws um, discrimination and segregation, and the Voting Rights Act of 65, which uh, outlaws um, poll tax, grandfather tax, and discrimination in voting uh, patterns. It is at this point that the civil rights movement itself, the realization of these two big goals, it begins to divide into one camp being the Martin Luther King, uh, or, well, a camp that followed King's teachings, let's put it that way. The camp that espoused nonviolence and a continued incrementalist approach to change, and then a separate wing, uh, generally a younger wing, a less college educated wing, that was more impatient, impatient with incremental change and wanted more immediate delivery of natural rights now, as opposed to waiting for white society's schedule to deliver those rights. That would be the movement of Nation of Islam, the Black Panther Party, Malcolm X, etc. In many of these communities in the late 60s, you had this impatient exploding into violence in urban areas, such as Newark and Detroit and Los An Watson, Los Angeles, generally over policies of containment and suppression, like acrimonious relationship with law enforcement, or frustrations with a class and race system, which was limiting the, the potential for persons of color and minorities to rise and have their share of the American dream. 
this is not like uh, certain disorders you can see for causation and linkage uh, within your own time uh, through places such as Minneapolis or Ferguson, Missouri, or even Charlottesville, Virginia. School desegregation promotes the response of white flight to the suburbs as we talked about, where many of these suburban, these white communities are recreated outside of these suburban rings or urban rings. These movements for civil rights expand beyond merely just African-Americans. And it's clear that the patterns, the toolkits, the strategies used by the American Indian movement, the Brown Berets of the Latino Chicano movement, uh, a or Asian Americans, the women's movement, the National Organization of Women, and gays and lesbians, particularly after the Stonewall riot, they are all adopters of the civil rights activism toolkit pioneered by the African-American groups. And you can trace that thread on a line in many ways. So let's look at an example in real application for a multiple choice here if we could. Stimulus, a quick crash course review, it's 40% of the test, so it's worth you understanding how it operates. The curriculum framework, as we discussed, this is what is tested, so it's not content. As much as you want content, what is being tested are concepts and topics. Content can be used as evidence as you understand those concepts and topics, but it's your understanding of the concepts and topics that questions will test. The link down here gives you the framework, the language in which the multiple choice questions are written. Items are set-based, two to five items around the same stimulus. They can be secondary sources, maps, pictures, cartoons, graphs. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, but some of you might not be, so I wanted to show that to you. All items, your multiple questions per uh, stimulus, they will all function independently. No item is going to help you answer another one, and no item is going to no item is going to give you three comparison questions and three contextualization questions. We will test different skills for each item of every question you receive for a, a stimulus. So let's read this piece here. Short answer prompt for skill and content, since we're talking civil rights. Current sit-ins and other demonstrations are concerned with something much bigger than a hamburger. Whatever may be the difference in their approach to their goal, students, North and South, are seeking to rid America of the scourge of discrimination, not only at lunch counters, but in every aspect of life. So what's our question here? First of all, it's a context question. The tactics you're talking about here best represent which? So it's sort of a backgroundy thing. How do we get here? What's going on here that's driving this prompt? Is it uh, about nonviolence, filing legal challenges, self-defense, petition to government? Well, sit-ins, more than anything else, they weren't worried about filing legal challenges. That was something we'd seen in other movements. It's nonviolence, nonviolent nonconformity to the laws of the land, which were seen as immoral laws. Way back thinking, sort of a transcendentalist theme there. Second question, which you will discover, is a causation question. The events described contributed most directly. So sit-ins led most to what? Desegregation armed forces? Well, this is why I say pay attention to your source codes. If you remember that Truman desegregated the military in 48, well, it can't be 1960. Ratification of the 15th Amendment, whoa, now you are way back in period five. That happens when the Civil War amendments, if you know your chronology. That's why four by four in chronology is so important. Supreme Court decision on Brown, that's 1954, and it's on education in particular, it's not really on this, which leads you to the non-discrimination passage, Civil Rights Act of 64. So you can pick them off sometimes if you know the things that are being discussed in there. Now your proper nouns here, 15th Amendment and Brown v. Board, they are actually named in the curriculum framework document itself. So as I said, any proper noun you do see, they are fair game to be tested. Why did I show you those two questions? Because those two types, what led to this and where did this come from? These are the most frequently tested skills in multiple choice. Over, well over half the questions that you get, no matter what the stimulus is, is gonna be this kind of topic. And I can't stress the importance of being prepared to see a question about why did this happen and what's the backstory to this, this stimulus we're talking about. That's what you're gonna get. Let's get ourselves back to that period eight content for a little bit then, shall we? Moving on to the 60s, even though it is part of the Cold War politics, the Vietnam War has its own separate topic within the framework. It does have ties to those earlier foreign policy goals of containing communism or even the domino theory that if, you, if one country goes communist, it'll knock down the other countries around it and they will all ultimately be communist. And the idea was that the logic was you had to fight the communists in Southeast Asia or tomorrow you're going to be fighting them in Kansas City. It was that whole kind of like appeasement thing. We can't give away anything on Czechoslovakia or he'll take the whole thing that Dr. Webb was talking about so astutely yesterday. The challenges the Americans found were the same challenges that we, you have sat a front row seat to on the evening news in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's the exact same challenge the British faced as the Redcoats during the American Revolution. If the Revolutionary War was England's Vietnam, then 
the Vietnam War is Amer- America's American Revolution with the United States playing the role of the British Redcoats. We are fighting big and heavy. We've got a military that's built to fight the Nazis in 1944. We send this military to fight the Nazis in 1944 into the rice paddies of Southeast Asia in 1965 to fight an unconventional war against irregular force with the same inevitable results the British had. It's very difficult to fight asymmetrical counterinsurgency warfare with a military designed to you know, beat large nation states. The Tet Offensive, a surprise attack in 1968 in which every major American military base is hit all at the same time, leads Americans to lose favor or lose belief that the war is ultimately winnable. And this becomes known as the so-called credibility gap. The Johnson administration kept saying, victory is right around the corner, right around the corner, right around the corner. And increasingly, no one bought that and um, did not believe what the government was saying. This engenders a protest movement where SDS, Students for Democratic Society, and a host of other youth-driven organizations um, that also don't want to be drafted, as well as being believing the war to be wrong, protest against the war on a large scale. And by the late 60s, dissatisfaction with the war and the administration are so large that it almost no longer needs organization. Mo- movements and marches could spontaneously um, cre- generate mo- uh, traction on their own. The counterculture emerging out of the beat movement, this so-called hippie movement, actually wants to reject American society and say that the American society is a lost cause. We need to actually form our own sort of culture against this and kind of drop out of the American model. You do also see this outpouring of both the counterculture and the youth movement, environmental activism. 1970 is the first Earth Day. Um, The Nixon administration is going to establish the Environmental Protection Agency as a cabinet-level agency. And Rachel Rachel Carson's Silent Spring is a book talking about the ravages of a potential ecological time bomb going off where we destroy our own planet environmentally, changes a lot of minds. To back up for a moment to what those minds had to be changed from, Lyndon Baines Johnson, as president, wanted to out New Deal the New Deal. And so the big government liberal state policies that he implements after his landslide election in 64 are really driven by this model of attempting to uh, fight a war on poverty, uh, Medicare and Medicaid, uh, which are medical programs for the poor and for the elderly, Job Corps for job training and job placement for young people and poor people across the country, uh, the aiding of impoverished regions of the country like the urban city and rural Appalachia and Indian reservations as well. And the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act, it, enfranchising people who historically have been marginalized. This over time will generate conservative pushback because it costs money and it, it, it results in you know, high taxes in many ways. And you see the pushback of a conservative Christian evangelical America against both big government and a nation at protest at war with itself internally that they think is just going through a nervous breakdown. And so you see tax revolts as Americans of that white middle class began rejecting the idea that government can solve these problems or should solve them and come up against what they see as the limits of the welfare state. You also have these culture wars, this generation gap from the 60s leading to culture wars over issues such as race, diversity, inclusion, ethnicity, religion, uh, abortion, music, literature, and culture. That all comes out in this sort of back and forth us and them attitude. So let's look at an example with SAQ if we could. A great cross-period question. You'll have three to five questions from which to choose. Um, Digital testers have no choices. Have 40 minutes for your first three questions, about 13 minutes apiece. Digital testers will have an additional two questions on the back end replaced in their long essay. These slides here we put in so you can simply see the types of questions you'll get. I'll allow you those to watch, those of you who want to see this, it's important to watch on your own when you uh, see the live stream after it's not being live. 20% of your test is SAQ for uh, in-person testers, 35 for digital. So this is, not, to use a double negative, this is not insignificant at all. Standard directions. You cannot use a bulleted list. You cannot use an outline. You must write within the space of your paper provided. Those of you testing at home, you will be testing uh, within a box, but you've got to mind your own time. You can write as much as you want, but you have three questions on one end and two on the other that you've got to distribute your time for. So let's look at a cross-period question. One similarity between the New Deal and the Great Society, New Deal being uh, Dr. Webb's talk the other day, one difference between New Deal and Great Society, and one reason for difference. You will see these comparison cross-period questions, particularly those of you pencil and paper. This is going to happen. You're going to get these on your exam. So let's look, you'd ask for this. Let's look at some real student work. This question from AP Classroom was actually on the national exam uh, some time ago. And so let's look at this question, please. So the answer is, or let's look at our answer that earns a point for part A, similarities. 
One similarity between the New Deal and the Great Society was the goal to lessen unemployment. Under the New Deal, the CCC, we got a piece of information there, employee for park registration, other projects. Let's elaborate on what that means. Similarly, LBJ was motivated to stimulate the economy, provide jobs in rural Appalachia. What's this all mean? This area is among the poorest in the United States. LBJ decreased unemployment, decreased unemployment with these great society measures. So that's our similarity in what we're doing here. That earns a point for adequately talking between the two. This next one, real student answer, does not earn the point. Both Insta New Deal and the Great Society held extensive emphasis on social programs. Period, full stop. There's not enough there there. We've answered the question, but we have neither cited evidence nor elaborated upon its meaning. Remember, if we were talking about the rule of nine or, or acing it uh, from John Burkowski's model from uh, Miami-Dade uh, high schools in the Florida area. Not enough there. So it's, it's lacking in that development. Part B, what's one difference? Different, uh, different student response on this part that earns the point. One difference between the New Deal and the Great Society was the Great Society had an emphasis on civil rights while the New Deal did not. That's gonna be important later on in our talk. The Great Society included civil rights acts, so we got evidence here, protect liberties of blacks, both politically and socially. In contrast, the New Deal has no such legislation and in fact, minorities receive much less benefits from it. That's gonna be important when we get back to content here in a moment. Again, single sentence, New Deal programs put in place to seek Americans jobs or to relieve our nation's great economic distress. This doesn't really address the question of difference at all. It simply talks about the New Deal and walks away. This is insufficient. There's not enough depth there to earn the point. Lastly, what's one uh, result here or what resulted from it? Stock market crash of the 20s caused a massive panic. Before this, America had a laissez-faire economy, which didn't involve the government and politics. The stock market crash led to the Great Depression and the idea that government should regulate the economy. The New Deal was a reaction to this and focused mainly on improving only America's economy. Remember part C, you just had to de grapple with one of these aspects, New Deal Great Society. We've explained there. Our next one here, we clearly are conflating time periods in the wrong way. Johnson did not want to repeat the Great Depression. Well, he's doing this in the 60s during a time of relative prosperity and took precautions and measures to ensure Americans wouldn't go through it again. Roosevelt wants immediate action, and Johnson was a precaution if it ever happened again. It's, that's not really even clear in a muddled sense what that actually means. This does not earn the point in that sense. Comparison of real student examples to walk through, and it doesn't take much. Two additional sentences, one additional explanation, often is enough to push you over the hump between those who can earn the point and those who cannot. So back to our content, and why was that question important? Why was the previous content important about, about Americans' views on the Great Society? Well, because of the Reagan era as a consequential presidency. Reagan is mentioned by name in the framework. He's extremely testable because his philosophy is going to set the parameters and drive the discussion in American political thinking on the role of government. Remember, Dr. Weber showing you the triangle of you know, classical and modern liberalism? This is going to drive that conversation from the Republican point of view, from Reagan's point of view, for the next 40 years, you know, up into almost into your lifetime. It's a rejection of both the Great Society and New Deal approaches to governance. And you have these shifting views of the welfare state. In the 30s, when the New Deal was primarily a program that aided white middle-class Americans, the New Deal was largely seen in the political narrative as being this positive good, helping people that were down on the luck and not their fault. By the 60s, as these social programs have a real thrust and emphasis on poor Americans in general, of all races, all colors, all creeds, you begin to see a shift within the white middle class of Americans that maybe these programs are not such a good thing because of the beneficiaries and the directions it's going. This goes along simultaneously with a switch in party allegiance as white Southerners who had never voted for the party of the Republican Party, being the party of Lincoln, the party of uh, you know, the Civil War, uh, um, the March to the Sea, all those things. They flipped their political alliances. And today, the part, modern party alignments you see with um, the Republicans, the South being largely, not largely, but a very much a heavily represented Republican voting area, and Northern and more diverse populations voting a bit more Democratic, that's where that inverts itself. And, and many reasons for it involved this quote from Reagan, one of his most famous quotations, that government is not the solution to our problems, government is the problem. And the entire philosophy of Reaganomics, of the conservative right, which is still in many ways um, Republican Party orthodoxy today, is cutting taxes, supply side or trickle down economics, cutting taxes on the wealthiest of Americans, um, and hoping those and presuming those benefits will trickle down to everyone else. Very sympathetic to a conservative Christian evangelicalism and a strong military. Conservative on social issues of abortion, gender, same-sex marriage, sexuality, gender roles, sex roles, what have you. 
So let's practice now using this whole model to try to use content and um, process together. So we're going to look at sourcing, that why. Remember your hip or happy work. We're not going to do all that tonight. We're going to get right, cut right to the chase, get right to the why. Because hip and hap or happy were exercise tools you used in school. But the whole goal was to get you to the point where in your head, you could determine what's the best and strongest way from among those four variables that I could use a document to help support an argument of mine. You don't need to, to apply all four. That would be H-I-P-P -P or H-A-P-P -P times seven documents. You don't have to do 28 things. You just need one of these aspects, variables per document, okay? And the goal is this document key. We've been trying to train you all year long, us, your teachers, everybody, to be able to use documents to, to help advance an argument, to make a case for something. And what does this source have to do with your question being asked or your position on that question? That's the whole point or purpose of any of these exercises. So let's use a sample question, a real AP classroom question. Explain the reasons, which gets right to the content we just talked about on purpose and uh, some of those elements. Explain the reasons why new conservatism rose to prominence in the US between 1940 and 1980, or 1960 rather, in 1989. Here's your documents, and we're not gonna use them all. I'm gonna show you one exemplar of real, you know, real student work, one exemplar of how you earn the historical situation point, or how you, or how to, not the point, but how to successfully engage in historical situation, how to successfully engage in use of audience for a document, how to engage in use of purpose, or how to engage in use of point of view to help show or demonstrate or prove something to make a case. So I'll just give you a rough summation of the documents. We're not even going to put them in buckets or subdivide them. I just want you to sort of know the lay of the land, the cards kids were dealt when they deal with this uh, question about conservatism. Barry Goldwater, Republican, is going to uh, be arguing that American, particularly the Republican Party, is betraying its principle of being not conservative enough. That's enough for you to know. Milton Friedman, as an economist, is going to argue that the big government programs get in the way of a free economy. A letter to Nelson Rockefeller is going to talk about discontent with American society and culture um, as a result of welfare programs and a lot of disorder in urban America. Jerry, Felwell, Jerry Falwell, as a television evangelist, is going to make the case for America as a, Christ, a center-right Christian nation that needs to conform to center-right Christian values. And the Republican Party platform of 1980, which is going to encapsulate many of those philosophies, as you see in the document itself, and a, a, a female a homemaker who wants to stop the Equal Rights Amendment, a woman pushing back against the notion that the Equal Rights Amendment is a good thing because it would alter conservative traditional values. These were the six documents. There was a seventh document. This was the transition year for the DBQ. It's enough for you to know there was a seventh document. There's a table that students did not have to use. That's irrelevant for our purposes, but that's why there's only six instead of seven. In any event, we're only going to look at four. I'm going to give you four documents, four real examples of students using a document to earn, to, to show a historical situation or an audience or a purpose or a point of view relating to an argument. So you've got that evidence. What are you going to do with it? You've got to show or demonstrate or illustrate or prove or explain how a document's audience or purpose or situation or point of view helps prove something, which is why the really simplistic model of the purpose of document three is, or the audience of document five is, that does, it can get you somewhere, but it stands a great chance of not getting you somewhere because it leads you to simply just describe that the purpose of the document was to explain this and then move on as opposed to answering or having, coming up with a sophisticated, nuanced, sophisticated argument. Now, here's a question, and it's a fair question. I had said at one point in an earlier episode that you do get a point from the DBQ rubric if you can kind of describe three of the documents relative to the question. So that's, you know, document three says that would earn you a point. I'm telling you to avoid that for the same reason I'm telling my kids to avoid that. My own students, be better. Be better. You don't want to talk about what document three says because that leads you to a conversation all about the documents. And remember, your thesis is the star of the show. It's center stage. It's the center of attention. When you start giving me document three says and describe the documents, you're bumping the thesis out of the center of the stage and are making the documents the star of the show. Your argument is always the star of the show. And so document three says, if you do that six times, you'll earn one point, but you will not get the second point for analysis because the second point, you need to use documents to show, demonstrate, illustrate, prove, to make a case and make an argument. And telling me, I've done this for 28 years now. I don't need you to tell me what the documents say. I can read it myself. The goal is to tell me what they show, demonstrate, and prove, which is you making an argument. And remember, you've got to make the sale. 
I'm willing to be sold, but you've got to make the sale on why your argument is a good one. Documents should be used to do that. So let's sneak a peek at the Republican Party platform then from 1980, our first document, and let's show you an example of historical situation, you know, making a case with the document. What's the platform say? Overseas, our goal in 1980 is to preserve a world at peace by keeping America strong. This policy once occupied a, an important place, a hallowed place in American diplomacy, but it was casually dismissed by the Carter administration, and the results have been shattering. So they don't like Jimmy Carter. Never before in modern history has the United States endured many as many humiliations, insults, and defeats as it has in the past four years. Our ambassadors murdered, our embassies burned, our warnings ignored, our diplomacy scorned, our diplomats kidnapped. They're referencing the Iran hostage crisis there of 1979. The Carter administration has shown that it neither understands totalitarianism nor appreciates the way that tyrants take advantage of weakness. Sounds like Hitler and Czechoslovakia, right? The brutal invasion of Afghanistan by the Russians, the Soviet Union, promises to be only the forerunner of a much more serious threat to the West and world peace should the Carter administration somehow cling to power. So they're saying, if you elect us, these are not the things that we want to do. We've seen the Carter administration in action. We don't like it. So how's historical situation come in? It's the things that are not mentioned in here. How can you mention it to make a case? Here's an example of how a student did it, a real high school student did it on the national exam. A major issue of Cardin's presidency was the Iran, Iran hostage crisis, where Iranian students seized the U.S. embassy and took hostages. So they're bringing in some context here, right? Some background. Carter's lack of response made the United States seem diplomatically and militarily weak. In the 1980 Republican platform, Doc 5, you don't have to parenthetically cite, but remember, I encourage you to, just so you can keep track. The authors alluded to the humiliation of the crisis and vowed to never show that kind of weakness. This document, here's our payoff word, it illustrates, it shows how the conservative movement felt that American foreign policy had to move in a completely different direction, and the Iranian crisis led many Americans to agree with, to agree with them by 1980, which gets back to our question of explain the growth of conservative movement. By 1980, the Americans are listening, and they're seeing, and they're saying, yeah, these Republican guys, they're making a lot of sense to me. Notice how different this is by pointing out sample events that are not described in the document and elaborating upon those events on what they mean based on the question asked. This is how you earn a historical situation point. Bring in some knowledge you know that has something to do with the source, then explain generally what the source is at, and then explain what that all means in regard to the bigger question you're being asked. Now you're, now you're making progress. You're making, hey, you're getting stuff done. Here's an example for audience now. Document three, it's real short. Letter written to Nelson Rockefeller, Republican of New York, by a citizen in New York, presumably. This letter is written to you by a law-abiding citizen who feels she is discriminated against by the dope addicts and the welfare cheats. I'm a widow who lives alone, works every day, pays my taxes, and lives by the rules. I get very little for my taxes when I can no longer walk on the streets and when I'm afraid of my own home. Sorry this letter is not typed. My typewriter was stolen in one of the great deadpan lines of all time to make her point about she sees these great society social welfare programs is not working, all right? And in just, you know, giving money to people that don't deserve it in ways that we said that uh, our portrayal of the New Deal was somewhat different in people's attitudes on that. So, but let's not focus on main point in context. Let's focus on audience. You got evidence here. Letter written by a disgruntled citizen to her governor. Here's audience. New conservatives want to reinstill the values of religion, family, hard work, and uh, in Christian care in America. They saw big government social programs to be having a detrimental effect. Th and the voice of many hardworking but frustrated individuals was expressed by a New York woman who wrote to New York governors because she, quote, feels she is discriminated against in favor of dope addicts and welfare cheats. By the way, with quotes, that's about as long as you need to be. Otherwise, the, your, the documents are right in your paper for you. Here's the payoff now. How's this audience? In appealing directly to the governor, the head of government in her state, she's explaining now, she was not merely writing some, quote, letter to the editor. She was desperately seeking the help of any and all political leaders who could ease her plight. That's her audience. This was because she wanted significant policy changes, and the governor was one of the most important politicians who could carry them out. So here, an important point to notice, notice how different this is than simply saying the audience of document three is the governor. That's not going to get you any points because it says it in the source code anyway, right? Letter to Nelson Rockefeller, governor of, of New York. Well, if it tells you that, you're not going to get any points because you did not just suddenly discover that on your own. We gave that to you. So that gets you no love. Lastly, developing purpose. Barry Goldwater, senator from Arizona, 
Franklin Roosevelt's rapid conversion from constitutionalism to the doctrine of unlimited government is an oft-told story. I am here concerned by the unmistakable tendency of the Republican Party, his own party, to do the same thing. The result is that today, neither of our two parties maintains a meaningful commitment to the principle of states' rights. Increasingly, by the way, by the 70s, states' rights would become code for uh, anti-desegregation and uh, preservation of the existing social order in the South. But that's a different sidebar. I'm just I'm getting where our content will get in a bit. Thus, the cornerstone of the republic, our chief bulwark against encroaching against encroachment of individual freedom by big government is the fast disappearing under the sands of absolutism. The root evil is that the government is engaged in activities in which it has no legitimate business. This is the conservative uh, voice speaking, the conservative mind speaking now, pushed back against the great society. As long as the federal government acknowledges a responsibility in a given social or economic field, its spending in that field cannot be reduced. So doesn't like what's going on, doesn't like what he sees. How could you use this now for purpose? A real student did this. Senator Barry Goldwater took on his own party in 1960, harshly accusing Republicans of not standing for anything, of going along with long-term liberal trends that were increasing the reach of the federal government to everyday lives. Well, okay, so what? Every time you describe the general, you know, what a doc, this is the document says, this is what the document says. Afterwards, always ask yourself immediately, so what? Okay, that sums it up, so what? Well, here's our so what. His purpose in doing so was that he hoped that by delivering such strong criticism to his fellow Republicans, he could get them to change and not just oppose efforts on increasing the size of the government, but actively work to roll it back. And that will be the story of period nine of the Reagan era. Notice how different this looks than just saying the purpose of document one is to tell us he's unhappy. You've got to do that. Last but not least here, I think, audience purpose point of view, our last one, the big four, point of view. How would you do point of view? Milton Friedman is an economist, says, we've got a lot of decades experience with government intervention. Which of these reforms the past decades got its objectives? He's implying none. A housing program that was going to make life better for people actually has increased juvenile delinquency, spread urban blight, made things work. The greater part of the vet made things not work. The better, greater part of the new ventures undertaken by the government in the past few decades have not delivered, is what he says. The U.S. has continued to progress. Its citizens became better fed, clothed, and housed. Class and social distinctions narrowed. Minority groups less disadvantaged. But all this, he says, is from individuals in a free market, not from government programs like the Great Society. So he says, get the government out of the way. Let the economy do itself. Okay? Point of view. What would you do here? Milton Friedman rejects the idea of welfare programs helping to solve the problems they're aimed at. As a conservative economist, we're giving his point of view now, he's a conservative economist, Friedman makes the case, and it's implied, it's implicit from his dialogue, but it's not said there. He makes the case for why um, capital markets are better than welfare spending. This illustrates, it shows we're delivering the goods. Longstanding belief of conservatives that big government programs of the Great Society New Deal had overreached and actually hurt America more than it helped it. So always follow up with what you're showing, illustrating, answering your so what question. His point of view is a conservative, and we're illustrating conservative ideas extending beyond the document itself. This is the elaborating you need to do. Now, oh boy, we're up against it. 52 minutes. I got to zip along here to be under my cheating time here, but uh, let's move on our way. The remainder of period nine, post-Reagan. Ending of the Cold War and economic change. The intensification of confrontation with the Soviet Union, part of the Reagan era military buildup, it generated an economic race more than an arms race that the Soviet economy was not built to sustain. And the Gorbachev uh, administration, his leadership, they ultimately realized the Soviets couldn't win in this race. And trying to actually keep up with the West in terms of the arms race spent the Soviet Union into economic oblivion from which ultimately led to their collapse in 1989 and 1990. And uh, that's the result of a lot of long-term policies on the Cold War, uh, going all the way back to Truman and Dwight Eisenhower. But it culminates itself in these policies with uh, their, their collapse. You've got a brief period of unipolar rule, where there's one superpower being the United States in this global world. But nature abhors a vacuum. And we're not going to stay in that position. And we're going to shift to a unipolar or multipolar geopolitics as you see the rise of the Pacific Rim, the rise of, of China in many ways, and shifting priority policies or shifting priority of policies to the Middle East and, and to uh, activities you see in, in uh, sub or subcontinental Asia in terms of uh, India, Pakistan, and China as well. Technological revolutions, you've lived this life. You are all babies of the internet, right? The interweb. And so the economy creates new winners and losers as you have outsourcing of jobs, globalization, uh, workforce obsolescence with technology and robotics. You walk into a grocery store or a department store, a home improvement store today, 
often you're going to check yourself out. There's no cashier anymore. Well, where'd that cashier go? Self-driving automobiles and trucks are just around the corner. Wages have remained stagnant for the middle class for about 40 or 50 years, even though the rich have gotten richer and great affluence has been created for the elite technological class and those who can possess information and know what to do with it. The shrinking middle class, for their part, um, struggles to keep and make ends meet as college and college education seems more and more difficult to reach every year. We are in the middle in this time of a third great wave of immigration. New arrivals from new locations, South and Latin America, Asia and India, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the requisite similar pushback that we've seen in other eras um, leads to forces against multiculturalism, forces advocating for immigration restriction. And more and more, you see the same arguments play out with different groups. The arguments against the Irish in the 1840s, against the Italians and the Jews and the Slavs of the 1900s are the same arguments employed against the migration waves today. Different people refuse to assimilate. They'll take our jobs. They'll work for cheap. They, they won't be part of our culture. These same parallels exist and drive all nativist thinking in all eras. The 9-11 terror attacks lead to the Bush doctrine of preemption, which is strike others before they strike you first uh, to prevent wars, which after 20 long years, this very year, it appears, we will withdraw from Afghanistan, a war that's gone on longer than you've been alive, seeing the limits of some of these open-ended conflicts and the limits of a national security state, which is still, in many ways, unfolding for us today. Lastly, the environmental challenges of your own time with climate change, global warming, and energy and resource consumption as we try to adequately you know, provide the greatest good for the greatest number and live a life of comfort and establishment for all people, along with social and economic and political justice. Whew, not a lot of proper nouns there, but a lot of material for two periods, a lot of advice to you as well. What should you take away? We walked through our standardized test survival skills today. If anything else, ignore the last part of this video, the last 50 minutes, go look at that first 10 minutes. That's where it's at. I mean, you've got to take that test. You need to know what you need to walk in doing. Content essentials for periods eight and nine, we kind of did the best we could keeping it tight. Your multiple choice refresher, that was really important. Your overview of comparison-based questions, cross-period items, be prepared to think cross-period in a whole host of regions. Look for similarities, parallels, analogic thinking, that's sophisticated stuff, and practicing your skill of sourcing. Your feedback, I'm sure you're going to tell me, boy, you went way too fast and gave us way too much. This whole week has been 10 pounds of potatoes and a five pound sack. I concede you that. We've been doing the best we could with it. But we hope from the, from the bottom of my heart, and speaking for Dr. Webb too, we hope we've made you better. We, we hope that you've always have walked away from these getting more than you walked in knowing, even if you never got as much as you could. It's a good thing you're trying to do out there and stay the course. You can do this. COVID or no COVID, virtual or no virtual, remote or no remote, in-person or no in-person, you can do this. We're so proud that you're... Uh, you're making it happen in these times. I'm Bill Pulaski from Stillman Valley High School. Three brief shout outs, Dalevale High School in Dalevale, Alabama, gateway to Fort Rucker, the largest helicopter training facility in the free world, Weston High School in Weston, Massachusetts, and of course, uh, Prospect High School in Mount Prospect, Illinois. Go United to Prospect, get right in and win that game. So best of luck to you. We hope to hear from you in the future and achieve. You can do it, you can make it happen. We have every confidence in you. Thanks so much. Good night from Sir Farewell for now.